Welcome to the discussion series on free trade and liberalization as part of the 1991 project at the Mercator Center. I'm Shruti Rajagopalan, and in this conversation series, I will be talking trade with Professor Arvind Panagarya, who is the director of the Deepak and Neera Raj Center on Indian Economic Policies and the Jagdish Bhagwati Professor of Indian Political Economy at Columbia University. In the past, he has served as the first vice chairman of Niti Aayog in the Government of India and also as the chief economist of the Asian Development Bank. He's an author of a number of books, but for today's conversation, in particular, we will focus on his recent books, Free Trade and Prosperity and India, the Emerging Giant. Arvind, welcome back. It is always such a pleasure to have you on the, on the series. My pleasure as well, Shruti, as always. In the last episode, which is episode six, we were talking about uh, the 1966 experience uh, of devaluation and the reasons, uh, you know, both political and circumstantial that led to its failure. But while we were discussing that, uh, I had asked you about uh, Professor Bhagwati, who was consulted, you know, one among many other economists by Mrs. Gandhi, on his views on devaluation. And of course, he had published on this. Uh, but I asked you about the in-person meetings and you said you will check. And it's lovely that you have Professor Bhagwati in the adjoining office. So did you actually manage to ask him? I did, Shruti. So I, I did speak with him. And uh, so, you know, he has uh, a, a very vivid memory. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he, uh, so, so he could uh, tell me back the uh, story as, as it happened. So apparently, you know, this, this was, uh, by his account, about a week or so before the actual devaluation uh, took place. Uh, and uh, C. Subramaniam, uh, who was the uh, uh, finance minister then, uh, uh, took him to Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, and uh, Jagdish had already met uh, uh, C. Subramaniam and given him some notes and so forth. Um, but uh, uh, as he arrived, he tells me uh, uh, to Mrs. Gandhi's office, um, you know, his secretary at the time was uh, L.K. Jha. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, th th this was just around the time, by the way, that, uh, 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 you know, as secretary, the, the MO had changed its, its character a bit, begun to change its character a bit. Uh, you know, most of the uh, power used to be with the cabinet secretary, actually, yes. in, in, in the pre uh, 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 Indira Gandhi era, uh, certainly under Prime Minister Nehru. Uh, but uh, L.K. Jha had been then appointed as the... So there was no secretary originally and there was no real PMO. You know, it used to be a small yes. office of the prime minister. But L.K. Jha was brought in for the first time as, as the secretary to the prime minister. Uh, and this idea of principal secretary, of course, that title came later. Uh, so anyway, L.K. Jha was uh, now already there as the secretary to the prime minister. And he very quickly came and uh, I grabbed Jagdish and, and, and took him in because he was afraid that you know, if they were photographers and took any pictures that he was going to, uh, to, to create a little bit of uh, a, a noise in the press and some speculation also that, you know, if Professor Bhagwati was seeing Mrs. Gandhi, there might be something going on with the exchange rate and all. So he wanted to avoid that completely. So he quickly kind of uh, grabbed him, took him to the prime minister's office. And uh, then the meeting between the two was uh, was more was very much a one on one meeting. Nobody else present. And uh, his by his recollection, you know, Jagdish says that she was mainly uh, uh, asking for his opinion whether this would be a good thing to do. Uh, uh, to which Jagdish replied in in, in the affirmative. And she was also concerned uh, uh, what what the uh, other senior economists are going to think about it. So, so on that, Jagdish was a bit uh, circumspect, you know, that uh, he, he really couldn't, couldn't speak on behalf of them. Uh, uh, I think she was also trying to gauge uh, particularly about K. N. Raj, who had uh, been involved, you know, throughout from the first five-year plan with the government. Um, uh, and apparently, you know, K. N. Raj had uh, uh, later, uh, Jagdish found out uh, that... Uh, uh, K. N. Raj had been explicitly consulted about this, uh, 
and and what he advised was that you know devaluation would be a good idea but uh, uh, don't liberalize the imports uh, uh but you know so so the, but this is the count is that uh, uh, what he learned after this episode was that uh, 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 you know these nuanced advices don't work uh, <laughs> because you know <laughs> the political uh, leaders are interested in the big issue that is your answer to devaluation yes or no uh, yes. and and the fact that kain raj had qualified that don't liberalize imports meant not very much to her so she saw it also kain raj kind of uh, giving an uh, 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 his opinion as being you know fine go ahead uh, 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 yes no what <laughs> happened so anyway uh, a bit, the, the, the meeting was relatively short between jagdish uh, and and mrs gandhi and uh, uh, he he says you know basically she kept her head down doodling something on on a piece of paper or something at the time uh, um, uh, he came out and all but then what happened was that uh, after devaluation uh, uh, kain raj sort of repudiated that this was not a good thing to have done uh, in his mind he sort of perhaps thought that well you know he has said don't liberalize imports but she liberalized imports therefore uh, his advice was not for it but he said mrs gandhi was very furious that came to that came to uh, jagdish from um, you know uh, uh, ramaswamy uh, at that time ramaswamy was uh, the economic advisor i think in the ministry of industry yeah and so uh, 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 jagdish said ramu told me this later on that uh, she was furious that you know he uh, kain raj had first uh, uh, advised uh, for devaluation and then publicly kind of repudiated it so anyway that was <laughs> roughly the the no, episode this is a great uh, account this actually i mean one thank you so much for checking with jagdish the the little bit uh, that i know of him and and him he has just the most incredible memory and is a great storyteller of you know yes. events like this so so yes. i'm i'm glad yes. that we have that Uh, as part of this discussion but also you know this tells us more broadly about the the problem of politicizing economic decisions beyond a point which is sort of what a socialism requires right it requires a certain degree of control in every aspect of society and once the politics has to be involved in every single economic decision making uh politicians who don't have that kind of nuance or don't have technocratic knowledge like say a dr manmohan singh when he was finance right. minister or prime minister then you mm-hmm. run into a lot of trouble because you need to know enough at least to take advice from technocrats if that right. is also missing then you know things can start going on shaky ground uh this is a good point to ask you about sort of the aftermath of what happened with the failed devaluation uh in particular indira gandhi's approach and the turn towards very highly restrictive imports regime uh which happened after this so can you talk us through the aftermath of this sort of failed or botched up devaluation which just didn't make anyone happy in in one sense yeah you know so um uh, uh A, a very critical factor uh, in in um, this was the fact that the evaluation took place in the midst of two back to back droughts yes uh, so 65 66 and i 66 67 were both drought years and uh, given the kind of very close nature of the indian economy uh, and the fact that agriculture was such a large uh, contributor to the gdp uh, you know uh, it, it probably declined since 1950 but still you know yeah. uh, it may uh, uh, i haven't checked the figures but possibly it was easily still 40% of the economy uh, and so even the industrial output kind of depended on what happened in agriculture because a lot of the raw material uh, supplies etc came from there uh so the agricultural failure also led to the industrial recession and industrial yeah. recession meant that then you could really couldn't, uh, 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 export uh, 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 very much either uh and uh, so you know therefore and, and and the failure on the export front I, I was was seen as a failure of devaluation uh and uh, uh, so you know 
and and also in the socialist environment of course from the beginning uh, 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 virtually everybody was opposed to devaluation it was seen as having been externally imposed uh, all those factors you know uh, uh, contributed to the immense uh, uh, unpopularity of of that action uh, and uh, so uh, 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 there was no you know constituency defending it largely uh, i mean you know i think uh, among economists, there were only two, right? That Tish Bhagwati was was supportive, uh, and then you had uh, uh, Manmohan Singh had written about it, but he was not in the system yet, as far as I yeah. remember, you know. So, uh, and, and he's in any case not uh, 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 very vocal about these things. Uh, he's not uh, that, that kind of person. So. Uh, 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 as a result, you know, very quickly the reversals began to happen in the policy. Uh, uh, even you know, soon after the evaluation, in fact, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, on the export front, uh, the incentives which had been withdrawn as a part of uh, 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 the full package returned. Uh, uh, but but before that, I say, let me point out one thing that that. Part of the reason, also economically speaking, uh, you know, part of the problem was uh, that at least uh, one other economist who was obviously uh, 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 in support of devaluation had been, I think, you know, the only economist who had been writing since the uh, 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 original uh, balance of payments crisis in 1957, uh, uh, that was B.R. Shanoi. Yes. Uh, he had written uh, uh, back in 1958 uh, uh, advocating devaluation when actually, you know, uh, it could have been successful because the economy yeah. was vibrant. Things uh, 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 yeah, there was no food crisis. Uh, uh, there was no drought. Uh, or, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the basics of the economy were in place. So there actually devaluation would have could have succeeded, but of course, you know, uh, Shana had not, uh, <laughs> nobody supporting him on, on yes. that front, including Nehru himself actually made a very clear statement saying that it is nonsensical to talk about devaluation of the rupee. So, uh, not his words probably, but, you know, yes. basically what he said amounted to saying that this, this, this whole talk was uh, of devaluation was nonsense. This was never in the cards or so, you know. So, um, uh, so Shanoi, in fact, said that, look, you know, uh, uh, Part of the problem of the successes devaluation was that um, it, it was not large enough. It, 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 yeah. it needed to be significantly larger because Shanoi had been also arguing persistently that, you know, uh, uh, what has happened over the years is that your exchange rate is fixed nominally uh, yes. and uh, your domestic inflation rate is much higher than the inflation of your comp competitor countries. So as a result, you know, your domestic market is becoming over time more and more lucrative for sales uh, and the foreign market is becoming less and less so. Uh, also, your uh, uh, imports are becoming more and more attractive because in real terms, the, the rupee has got greatly overvalued uh, it, because throughout it was appreciating in real terms. Uh, and and so and it was already you know uh, uh, 15 16 years since uh, the economic development process started and some of this deficit financing etc had already uh, was being uh, done uh, so his view was that this uh, you know what uh, the devaluation was not large enough Yes. Uh, on top of that, uh, also some of the calculations by uh, Bhagwati and Srinivasan later on uh, uh, that were done uh, concluded that uh, the effective devaluation ended up being much less yeah. because of the withdrawal of the export subsidies uh, and import liberalization. So yeah. both of those factors also. And so they they calculated apparently Bhagwati and Srinivasan that uh, about, you know, on the export side, effective devaluation Instead of you know the the nominal devaluation was thirty six and a half percent, but they said on the uh, export side it it was reduced to about seventeen point eight percent, and on the import side it was reduced to uh, about twenty nine point seven percent. So so that sort of again reinforces the. Shanoi argument as well that you know given that even the the effective devaluation itself was less than thirty six and a half percent of the nominal devaluation, uh, uh, overall it was it 
it was too little and too late. Uh, so that was that factor, uh, droughts I already mentioned to you. Also, uh, from the government of India's viewpoint, uh, 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 and this is something that uh, 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 two economists who have written also uh, about this era, uh, 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 Joshi and Vijay Joshi and uh, Ian Little, uh, they have a good uh, you know, uh, book on the macroeconomy of this entire area up to 90, uh, 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 era up to 1994, in which they sort of say that uh, there was also the expectation of about $900 million per year of aid for a fair number of years on the part of the government of India as a part of the package uh, uh, of devaluation. Uh, but that aid, those expectations of aid were did not actually materialize, and and that also became a sore point with the government. And they said they were completely justified, therefore, in uh, bringing back the export subsidies and the import restrictions. Yeah. So uh, the export uh, subsidies, export incentives, as they were called, you know, they began very soon after the evaluation. In yes. fact, you know, I checked this morning the economic survey of 1966-67, and it says that you know. Uh, a new export uh, incentives uh, policy was already being designed uh, starting in mid-1966, which is the timing of the devaluation. So it was practically, yeah. you know, according to the survey, uh, it, 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 it was being done practically uh, concurrently, concurrently with devaluation. Uh, so, so they described there, you know, and and uh, 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 so, so many of those measures uh, uh, came out by 1967, according to Joshi and Little, uh, import replenishment, cash subsidies, uh, supply of domestic inputs to exporters at international prices, duty drawbacks, um, all that, you know, basically they, they were back by 1967. And by 1970, 71, uh, they also say that the import controls had returned with full force uh, and they actually became even more stringent than uh, before devaluation. Yeah. And, and that, of course, import compression was automatic. You know, even if the policy itself doesn't announce, yeah. when you don't have the foreign exchange, uh, uh, because exports are not doing well, uh, automatically import compression begins. Yeah. Uh, and, and so even, you know, uh, 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 if the import uh, restrictions themselves may have taken a little, you know, few years to come in place, it didn't matter very much because the import yeah. licensing policy was in place yeah. and therefore you could easily you know accomplish import compression through uh, a slowdown in, in in the issuance of the licenses so you'd see this you know very rapid very, very uh, uh, sharp decline uh, in the uh, uh, imports uh, yeah. so you know as a part of 60 uh, so so you if you start you know 65 66 this is just the year prior to devaluation. Uh, the import to GDP ratio was 5.1%. Yeah. Uh, in the year 66, 67, which is the devaluation year, uh, imports as a proportional GDP rose uh, by 1.5% to 6.6%. To, to yeah. But thereafter, steadily declined. Decline. You know, they, they every single year, uh, in the following three years, imports uh, as a proportion of the GDP, not just the, you know, not in absolute terms, but the, as a proportion of the GDP, they continue to fall. And by 1969-70, they had reached four percent. Now, you know, yeah. the, uh, you know, given that these imports also include the food imports that were happening, oil imports that were happening, uh, this is hardly, you know, you'd say that pretty much as far as the uh, non-food, non-oil economy was concerned. We probably had gone into close to autarky, uh, yes. not quite, but 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 close. But very so, close. So yeah, so so it was quite quite a serious compression uh, 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 by 1969-70. So I would say there's one more thing happening simultaneously, which is the political uh, crisis within the Congress that Mrs. Gandhi is dealing with, right? So she's trying to establish herself, and the opposition to her within the Congress is dubbed the syndicate. You know, this is, of course, K. Yeah. Kamraj and Muraji Desai and so on. And they are more liberal minded relative to her. I mean, I'm talking yeah. about this within when I say liberal minded, I mean, in a in a 1960 Congress sort of 
way. Uh, but right. they started recognizing the failures of extreme command and control. They saw the foreign exchange sort of crisis. They thought they should move further outwards, right? And Mrs. Gandhi took this as an opportunity to establish herself as the other side and started turning firmly inwards, uh, of course, assisted by P. and Huxer and, you know, sort of the people she surrounded herself with who were very, very socialist. And you see this also in other policies, you know, uh, in by the late 60s, you have bank nationalization, which is the really, really big one. And after that, you have, you know, all your sick textiles and coal mines and, you know, whatever wasn't included in general insurance in the Nehru regime starts getting nationalized. So you have this spate of nationalizations between, say, 67 and 75. So that has nothing to do directly with the external sector, but this sort of massive uncertainty that is imposed and also almost sort of an attack on the private sector. Uh, it's not surprising to me that given the lack of foreign exchange and exports being depressed, you have massive import compression because now who is demanding these imports? Forget that we don't have the currency to actually acquire them. Uh, the firms are just completely under attack at this point. Totally. I think, you know, totally. Uh, and uh, one more important legislation I'll mention there, uh, quite relevant to industry and therefore trade, and that was the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices yes. Act that was in, uh, brought in 1969. Uh, and actually that, you know, the, the one fallout of that act was that, you know, this act basically defined what were the uh, uh, MRTP firms. Any firm which had investment, I think, you know, the assets worth something like 200 million rupees or something, but, but relatively low cap, uh, were, were defined as the MRTP firms that, that uh, they were too large, they're big business houses. And, and so even if they were operating in different sectors, but the total, you know, the definition was in terms of total assets of the industry group taken together. So any industry group or single firm or what have you, any entity which had assets worth, let's say something like, as I said, 200, 200 million rupees worth, uh, got defined as an MRTP firm. And then their uh, 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 access to licensing was then limited to a list of core industries. So yes. a list was drawn up of core industries, which were all highly capital intensive industries. Uh, and in effect, they, what it meant was that these MRTP firms uh, could apply for licenses only within that core group of industries. So, you know, uh, what, what you've done there is taken your most successful firms. I, I mean, yes. you know, the very fact that uh, these uh, industry groups or these uh, enterprises had uh, a, a large amount of assets uh, by the standards of the day uh, meant that they were successful enterprises. Uh, but then you say, that, ah, but I'm going to restrict you further in terms of what you can do, uh, what you can yeah. produce. Uh, and then you take them into the most labor intensive sectors, right? So what that also means that all capital will basically be absorbed by these enterprises in those sectors, uh, thereby starving the rest of the economy of any capital whatsoever. Uh, so, you know, workers are working there without, in, in large part of the workforce, which is non-agricultural, you know, large part of the non-agricultural workforce, basically has no capital you know they are sitting in these tiny little enterprises cottage industries household uh, uh, sector uh, uh, you know the, so the small was really very small at the time even by definition you know when mrs gandhi introduced this restriction of small scale industries reservation yeah. i mean it, it had been practiced as a practiced as a part of the the the, the 1951 uh, 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 idra the the industrial development and regulation act uh, 1951 uh, it was there in practice, the small scale industry the, the regulation, but she formalized it as well, I think around 67, 68, somewhere there. Uh, you know, so there was another new development that had taken place by the, uh, by the, uh, before the 1960s were over, uh, that a list of industries was drawn up uh, uh, as a part of, I think, IDRS 56 itself. Uh, yes. uh, 
Lift idea of 51. 51. Uh, uh, and, 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 and formally, any large enterprise where large was, you know, nothing more than a million dollars in investment, yeah. uh, probably even less, uh, 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 was not permitted in those sectors. So, so you know, and, and, and these are sectors where you have comparative advantage because of the preponderance of Absolutely. labor force, uh, cheap labor. Uh, uh, the kinds of sectors where Korea and Taiwan, uh, in parallel, were becoming uh, progressively more and more successful. Uh, uh, that's exactly what was kind of denied. So I, I think you know uh, uh, you're absolutely right that all these other developments were uh, happening uh, alongside as well, which were uh, you know uh, basically strangulating the industry. I mean, there was that uh, you know I think somewhere I recall in my India the Emerging Giant book I. Refer to this this period as saying you know that uh, there is strangulation of the Indian industry. Absolutely, and you know when you talk about MRTP, the focus is largely on domestic firms. Uh, I want to actually uh, go in a slightly different direction and talk to you a little bit about foreign firms, in particular the foreign investment policy. Uh, you know, this is a policy that started in Nehruvian times, and it was r- relatively liberal regime under Nehru. Uh, and then, of course, post devaluation under Mrs. Gandhi, this also takes an invert turn. But uh, can you walk us through India's foreign investment policy? Maybe you know, go back to Nehru's time uh, and and describe what this policy was, and then bring us back to the devaluation moment and talk about how it impacted foreign firms and so on. Yeah. Okay, so very interesting history there on foreign investment. Uh, uh, you know, as as we have discussed already uh, uh, on 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 uh, the uh, Nehru era was relatively more liberal. Yeah. Uh, and if you take, you know, um, I mean, Nehru really effectively became prime minister in 1946, uh, uh, even though the constitution was adopted in 1950 and elections happened late afterwards. Uh, but but certainly, you know, he was uh, firmly the Prime Minister of the country, uh, much much before the constitution was adopted, uh, and so the era until about 1957-58, uh, uh, even on trade side, had been liberal, you know. Uh, 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 and and uh, some of my own research, ongoing research on the Nehru period, actually, I find that uh, uh, you know publicly as well as uh, among the political class, uh, there was a lot of support for uh, uh, liberal trade policies. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, if anything, kept them from uh, 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 you know uh, opening completely. It was always the foreign exchange availability yes. question, and but as long as you know the uh, sterling balances which India had accumulated uh, 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 during the Second World War, because we were rather successful actually in exporting yeah. a lot more than we were importing, uh, and so we had accumulated a lot of foreign exchange, which uh, were known as the sterling balances. Yes. Uh, and uh, these sterling balances later on became available to us, uh, uh, and and they and and using that actually, uh, uh, broadly speaking, until about 1956-57, we maintained a fairly liberal import regime. It was only then, you know, when sterling balances ran out and foreign exchange became very scarce and all, uh, that is where the the whole kind of restrictive import regime came into play. So, so also, with Nehru, you know, in 1947-48, as you said, you know, he was already prime minister. The provisional parliament and government was in place, but there were some debates in 1948-49 about the status of foreign firms because, uh, as part of uh, independence, there was also a question of, you know, there are all these foreign firms, especially British firms, European firms. Uh, are, can they continue to invest in India? Can they continue to repatriate profits? Will they be taxed in the same way? Will they have additional penalties or no penalties at all? So uh, this is a hot button issue, you know, after 1947. So how does Nehru deal with this, and how does it inform his foreign investment policy? Uh, you know, at the beginning of his uh, prime ministership. Right. So so philosophically, by this time, you know, Nehru. I think this uh, um, uh, there are two factors. One, of course, you know, Nehru himself uh, 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 was a bit of a changed uh, changed man uh, 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 on 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 this uh, set of policies, the so socialism, so to say. Uh, the the Nehru of uh, you know uh, late nineteen thirties, uh, 
uh, particularly if you go, what was it, the Lucknow uh, um, uh, um, Congress. session where he was the president. Uh, he was a very fiery socialist, you know, I mean, yeah. bordering uh, communist. Uh, it's sort of, you know, if you take that look at that speech, uh, uh, it's it, it's clearly not the Fabian socialist. Uh, this whole notion that somehow Nehru was Fabian socialist uh, uh, always since his days in Cambridge and London uh, as a student, uh, it, it's all wrong, actually. But anyway, that's a separate story. Uh, uh, but it was the discussions in the National Planning Committee uh, between 1938 and 1940, which really uh, brought Nehru face to face with the Indian industrialists uh, who uh, uh, were, uh, were sort of appalled with the possibility that, you know, the, uh, uh, the socialism in India could turn into a complete kind of uh, ouster of the private industry. So there's a lot of pushback at these meetings for the National Planning Committee. And that's where I think Nehru found that. Anyway, he's also a side of Nehru was always very pragmatic that, you know, what is feasible. Uh, so so that's my reading that, you know, uh, there, there's nothing to be tracked in Nehru's writings themselves to see, you know, how this transition in his own thinking happened. But it seems that, you know, so anyway, why, you know, uh, if you look at the, con uh, the constituent uh, assembly uh, uh, debates, etc., <laughs> Nehru is having to defend uh, uh, a more liberal policy against the attacks from the socialists and the communists, you know. Uh, uh, and this is where you begin to see that there is a Fabian socialist, uh, Nehru, kind of uh, 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 revealing himself. Uh, 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 so, so he says, hey, look, you know, so he, the, the view he adopts here is that, look, ultimately our objective is to increase output, production. And if, it, if production can be increased by the government participating, we should have the gov government participate all the way. Uh, but, you know, where private sector can uh, deliver, we should have the private sector. We should let them. And as a part of this whole uh, uh, objective that took, you know, ultimately what we need to do is increase production. Yeah. Uh, he was also very accommodative of the foreign, invest, uh, foreign invested firms. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so in effect, you know, also I should say that around this time, and there is a counter factor because uh, uh, there are people like Sardar Patel uh, 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 very much uh, 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 counter force there. Yes. So they also kept the socialists a bit in check. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, if you look at, for example, industry policy resolution of 1948, that actually is, is, is far more liberal. Now, once Patel was, had disappeared from the scene and he died in December 1950. Yeah. A hardliner, a harder line uh, socialist Nehru did emerge actually in the subsequent years. Not quite, you know, because he was also pragmatic, so he didn't want to disturb a private industry. But if you look at 1956 industry policy resolution, yes. uh, that moves much more towards socialism uh, mm -hmm. because it is also preceded by this whole resolution on the socialistic pattern of society and all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and uh, also the uh, directive principles of policy are, are moving in the socialist direction, uh, and all that gets reflected in, in, in the 1956 industrial policy resolution, which is much more socialist than the 48 one was. So from which I conclude that you know there were counter forces which were keeping also to some degree Nehru in check uh, on on uh, socialism because once those counter forces were gone. A, a bit more kind of uh, socialist narrow did emerge uh, in, in the subsequent years. So this is the kind of political uh, 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 equation as I read read it from, from the various things that I have read. But uh, 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 coming to the actual policy stance, therefore, um, you know, first of all, Nehru in the industry policy resolution uh, of the Congress 1948, uh, a guarantee was given actually that for 10 years we are not going to nationalize any industries. Yes. Uh, and that applied not to just uh, domestic, but also foreign industries. All firms. So yes. a, a clear assurance was given that there was going to be no nationalization. Nehru had also said that you know they'll bring the foreign investment policy, but rather than bring the policy, what he did was to, in April 1949, uh, give a, a, a foreign investment policy statement. So it, it, it didn't necessarily have the legal force, but it ended up basically becoming the framework 
for the policy that was then adopted pretty much throughout the Nehru era. So in the foreign uh, uh, in this foreign investment policy statement, uh, this is April 1949. The salient features I will uh, 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 describe what 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 they were. So he accorded national treatment to the existing foreign investments, thereby ending any discrimination against them. Right. So this is quite you know even today we don't automatically extend uh, yes. uh, uh, national treatment to foreign investors. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah. all these uh, uh, bilateral investment treaties, etc., you know, are, are what governed the the status of the uh, 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 of the uh, foreign investors, and and often and, uh, the the national treatment is far from automatic uh, today uh, in, in the in, in the investment policy. But he granted that he promised uh, policies to enable foreign investment that you know we will. Uh, do everything to uh, provide enabling environment for the foreign investors. Uh, also, he permitted the remittances of profits and dividends of foreign companies abroad. So that was a big thing, right? You know that that uh, 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 foreign, in spite of foreign exchange issues, uh, uh, foreign exchange scarcity, etc., assurance was given that remittance that the foreign funds will be allowed to remit. Uh, profits as well as dividends uh, at, 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 as necessary, uh, and he provided for controlling foreign interest in companies uh, for a limited period of time. So this was a relatively, given the uh, state of uh, politics at, at the time, it was a very liberal kind of foreign investment policy, which was largely maintained. 1949-50 uh, uh, budget implemented these promises. Uh, and in addition, it provided uh, depreciation allowances and income tax exemptions to a wide range of foreign companies. It abolished capital gains tax on foreign companies. 50-51 uh, budget for went further. It reduced the business profit tax, personal income tax, and super tax as applied to foreign companies and their employees. Uh, 1957, the government gave a number of concessions to foreign firms, including reduced wealth tax and tax exemption to foreign personnel. So uh, this, this process continued in 1959-61 budgets, the government lowered corporate taxes on income and royalties of foreign firms. Uh, India also signed these agreements to avoid double taxation to lower the tax burden of foreign investors uh, with the major source countries such as the United States, Sweden, Denmark, West Germany, Japan. And in 1967, the government established an Indian investment center with offices in the major sources of private foreign capital to disseminate information and advice on profitability of investing in Indian foreign uh, in India to foreign investors. So, a lot of good good uh, steps were taken. Uh, 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 there is a famous book by by uh, uh, I think Michael Kidron. Kidron is what I remember, yes. but uh, uh, a 1965 book. So, um, uh, according to him, Western multinationals uh, were initially lukewarm to India in, uh, uh, in, in the early 50s. Uh, but in the period following 1957, uh, quite a bit of foreign investment did come into the Indian industry, uh, 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 including in, in sectors that were regarded as non-essential. You know, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, this this. This, you know, what is essential and what is not essential has been a part of policy thinking in India. You know, it still remains. Yes, okay, it still you remains. Still begin to see. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, that oh, let's, you know, like, uh, 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 there is still there are still some people who think that oh, there are these non-essential imports and why are we importing these? And particularly, yeah. you know, when it comes to China, they say oh, you know, these are not essential imports. So <laughs> uh, if, if they're coming from China, let's stop them. So, yeah. so this kind of still that baggage uh, continues, but uh, the Kidron uh, estimates, Kidron estimates uh, that uh, between 57 and 63, uh, as many as 45 percent uh, uh, approvals of new capital issues involved foreign investment. So you can yeah. see. Yeah. Now you know. Uh, remember that there is investment licensing on the side, right? Yeah. And and. Uh, and uh, there, there are very limited resources uh, available for. Uh, uh, capital imports, you know, because the, the the general sense is that look, you know, for industries that have been established, raw material, intermediate inputs, uh, components, uh, 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 any parts that may break down a lot, those should get priority. 
because yes. with limited foreign exchange, those should get priority. So capital investment, you know, often required actually uh, uh, the, the enterprises to find their sources of foreign exchange. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, if investment, uh, uh, if the enterprise is going to invest in cap, uh, in machinery, et cetera, and which has to be imported, find your own foreign exchange resources. Uh, yeah. and, and so it, the collaborations with the foreign firms became very important. And, and yeah. uh, uh, this is where Kedron's estimate, you know, that almost 45% approvals uh, of new capital issues involve foreign investment. Uh, so that's a very large proportion, you know. Uh, yeah. That Hathi committee sort of said that this was the time during which most foreign uh, uh, drug firms, uh, yeah. you know, set up their manufacturing subsidiaries in, in, in India. So, so uh, uh, there was uh, there was also an RBI survey uh, of 1969, which uh, Bhagwati and uh, Desai book uh, 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 yeah, mentions. Senses. And and uh, uh, according to that survey, there were 827 private sector firms with foreign participation of some kind. So that's a fairly large number, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, 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 it, uh, so 591 had actually equity participation, uh, with 262 having majority foreign holdings. So you can see the liberalism of the time that, yeah. you know, uh, out of the 591 firms with equity participation, as many as 262, uh, which is uh, pretty close to half of the uh, foreign invested firms had majority foreign holdings. Uh, uh, yeah. So, and, 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 you know, I remember a lot of the foreign, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the, these products were available in those days. Yeah. Uh, it's only you know after Mrs. Gandhi came in and and then and then uh, they, they began to be uh, gradually phased out, but yeah. um, but uh, but but they they existed. So all evidence you know on policies and outcomes uh, during the Nehru era really yeah. points to a very liberal regime compared to what was to come after Nehru. Yes. And, you know, a few things here. So one, of course, this uh, tells us a lot about Nehru. I agree with you that there's a certain pragmatism in his socialism. And one thing I do admire about Nehru, I've been a critic of a lot of the economic policies, but one thing I admire is that the overall goal of economic growth and sort of, you know, technological advancement, industrialization, this was front and center. Now the economic model of going about it was clearly wrong, right? But he went with whatever he believed and the orthodox he believed right. at the time. Right. But the overall vision of, you know, the size of the pie must grow, India must grow each year, there must be new technology coming in and, and you know, so on. That, I think, is something uh, which is which is important to note because not all the yeah. socialism we've had has been of the same color. Uh, the right. second, I think, you know, this goes back to one of our earlier conversations when we talk about, you know, import substitution and protectionism. And you were talking about how uh, foreign competition is not just about availability of foreign goods and widgets of some sort, right? It is also about availability of technology, of knowledge. And if you have foreign firms setting up in India, one way of thinking about it is they can bring maybe machinery from abroad. But the other thing they bring in is they function in other countries that are not autarkic or as closed as India. So they know what the global competition is, what the standards are, and they are able to manufacture at those levels or those standards. And even something like, you know, there isn't enough foreign exchange to replace a machine. If you have foreign collaborations, you may be able to, uh, you know, find collaborators who can repair the machine because they have the technological know-how to do that. Uh, whereas if you only have Indian firms and you're used to importing and now you can't import and the machine breaks down, uh, which we saw, you know, lots of examples of that in the in the late 70s, where if a tiny part broke down, that's it. It's, it's you know, a huge chunk of the capital investment of that particular firm was lost waiting for the import license or waiting for the investment license. So there are many, many benefits uh, other than just availability of foreign goods that comes from this kind of liberal regime, uh, which we saw during that, you know, 50s era. Uh, roughly speaking, just a lot of technical expertise coming into the Indian economy, uh, a lot of sort of know-how, you know, building of human capital without people necessarily leaving the country, learning at the workplace and so on. Uh, totally, totally. I think, you know, uh, uh, it, it uh, and there is also a spillover uh, across, you know, this is the time that India is uh, setting up some of these IITs and IIMs, etc., 
Absolutely. Uh, and and so that also provides a bit of a link. The existence of the foreign firms uh, yeah. uh, helps that, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the, the graduates being able to interact with those firms. And also, you know, uh, in in that generation, uh, uh, the jobs in these multinationals were very coveted jobs, yes. uh, for good reason. For good reason, uh, and and so it, it also helped uh, uh, develop the skills of of, of the uh, uh, Indian graduates, both on engineering side as well as on the management side. So so undoubtedly, you know, uh, as I said, ultimately, of course, you know, uh, um, to me, everything is a bit endogenous that. Uh, the, the the fact that the choice of the model ended up being wrong yes. uh, uh, unleashed the forces eventually that that gave growth also a bad name. Yes, you, you see, I mean, when when the uh, when the pie really doesn't grow fast enough, uh, and, and your explicit objective is to grow the pie uh, uh, to to combat poverty. So so you know, if the poverty did not decline, then this alternative view that oh you know growth can't really deliver it as growth has failed right yes. growth did not fail growth simply did not happen in enough volume yeah uh, uh, so it was not a failure of growth but the failure of growth to actually happen uh, uh, in the desired uh, 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 volume and and that, that is why you know the poverty did not fall enough but but that unleashed forces unfortunately you know which was also to some degree um, Sort of in line with the socialist philosophy, that that ultimately, you know, a very important part of the socialist philosophy is to redistribute and to yes. uh, and, and and to uh, bring uh, 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 public sector control of the resources. So on both counts, I think you know the failure of growth to happen, and therefore the wrong choice of the model model ended up being at the heart of actually what was to come. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, 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 what happened subsequently under Mrs. Gandhi, to a significant degree, was was endogenous uh, to yeah. the system. Of course, the leadership matters, and the fact that you know, uh, P. N. Haksar was brought in by Mrs. Gandhi uh, did make a big difference. You know, who who yes. uh, uh, serves in the prime minister's office makes all the difference, and Haksar was. Uh, boy, you know, he was no liberal uh, uh, <laughs> socialist, right? I mean, he was yes. not just, he, he was not a Fabian socialist. I mean, he was a yeah. hardcore kind of uh, communist, if you would call it, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, so he was much more, uh, and, and, and so the, so therefore all the policies that. Uh, that came after. Uh, and then Mrs. I mean, by all accounts, Mrs. Gandhi did rely quite a bit on PN Aksa. Yes. And so, you know, so PN Aksa, I think, was the successor actually of LK Jha. LK Jha, yes. Yes, yeah. and he's the one who really made that, you know, the principal secretary of the prime minister as the locus of control in the yeah. Indian economy. Much I think so. that happened under Haksar, or at least it got, you know, really yeah. rigid under Haksar, and to some extent yes. continues till now. Uh, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. another Much legacy. So. No, 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 yes, no, no, no. I mean, very quickly, you know, uh, and perhaps already under Haksar. The the uh, importance importance that the cabinet secretary had held declined. Yes. You know today uh, 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 today the principal secretary of the, uh, uh, in the PMO wields a lot more power than the uh, cabinet secretary cabinet does. Secretary. Uh, Absolutely so, yes, because the principal secretary is a is manning the the prime minister's office, right? Yes, whereas the cabinet Which is the locus of control. Even, yeah, and the cabinet secretary even physically is located in the Rashtrapati Bhavan. You know, yes. uh, he's at arm's length from the prime minister's office. <laughs> so, yeah. And, so. you know, this is another interesting point here is I was recently reading Nikhil Benin's book and he talks about how, you know, planning and democracy went side by side or they were attempting these two seemingly incompatible forces. And he talks about how Mahalanobis really creates the planning infrastructure in the early years of uh, uh, the Indian economy and, you know, creates plan consciousness and how five year plans were propagated and so on. So he's a historian. It's a lovely book. And in, in a conversation with him, one of the things that he pointed out was how after the second five-year plan, which is Mahalanobis, uh, is vision, things are now so centralized that a lot of cabinet ministers were quite upset that 
everything is going through Mahalanobis and the Prime Minister and not necessarily through the Ministry, Minister for Industry or Commerce or the Finance Ministry and so on and so forth. So there was already this centralization that was taking place in the early 50s, crystallized by the first and second five-year plan, uh, where the cabinet was becoming less and less important. And then, as you said, you know, once LK Jha comes in and then, of course, P. N. Haksar, uh, even how the files move within the Indian economy, uh, right? And uh, within within North and South Block and Rashtrapati Bhavan, that sort of triangular area and who sits where starts becoming very, very important. And, and you know, who is controlling the final approvals? And it's clearly the principal secretary to the prime minister's office at this point and, and has been for a good 40, 50 years now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And by the way, on, on the... Um... Uh, objections within the cabinet, you know, the, I'm forgetting now the name, but one of the finance ministers had resigned, actually. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, John uh, Mathai? When, uh, Mathai. I think it's Mathai, yeah. This brings us now, I want to come back to the devaluation moment and the failure of devaluation in in 66. Now, how does that impact the foreign investment policy? Because, you know, the Nehruvian time is a relatively liberal regime and you know, foreign firms are happy to set up in India, partner in India. They're also growing, of course, within the limits of India's, you know, foreign exchange situation. But it seems to be going well. But now with the failed devaluation and the further invert turn domestically and MRTP and so on, what is happening with the foreign investment policy and the impact on foreign firms under Mrs. Gandhi's regime? Yeah, so, you know, this tightening... Uh, happens all around uh, and uh, 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 alongside the import policy, uh, you also have tightening happening on foreign uh, uh, investment policy. Uh, so, you know, as an example, because of the shortage of foreign exchange, uh, questions get asked, well, you know, why are we allowing these remittances of dividends and profits and royalties uh, abroad? So, <laughs> you start clamping down, you know. Uh, so uh, it, 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 a lot of restrictive uh, measures were introduced on foreign investment and technology imports. Uh, 1968, Foreign Investment Board was appointed. Uh, now, any of the big, anyway, uh, 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 investment, foreign invested proposals, anyway, had to go through cabinet. But mm-hmm. even for the smaller ones, you know, proposals that were uh, 20 million or less, uh, which did not have to go through this kind of scrutiny, yeah. uh, uh, it, 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 it basically decisions got used to get made at, at the bureaucratic level uh, 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 under usual processes, meaning, you know, so there was no serious restrictions on that. And, and generally, as I said, you know, uh, uh, they, they had been looking earlier for foreign collaboration uh, to cover yeah. the... Uh, uh, cost of uh, capital goods imports. Uh, now, you know, scrutiny became much closer, even for all any investments that were less than 20 million uh, 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 with foreign equity below 40% uh, had to be approved by this newly appointed uh, foreign investment board. And now, th- th- this is a new innovation, by the way, yeah. which often not keeps coming back. And, yes. and uh, 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 it, it existed actually till uh, recently while I was at the Niti Aayog and during that period is when uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi actually finally did away with the foreign investment yeah. board. Uh, yeah. uh, it actually so, so right changed now, color under A.N. Verma uh, because, you know, A.N. Verma uh, in, in Narsimha Rao's cabinet was using it to attract foreign investment, kind of the opposite of what they were doing in the 60s but you're right that it has continued as a legacy for a very 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 long long period of time the scrutiny yeah. of who gets invited to the table <laughs> yeah, right right yeah yeah so 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 there's one thing then uh, also they drew up uh, three lists of products uh, 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 those in which no foreign collaboration would be permitted those in which technical collaboration would be permitted but not foreign investment um Royalty payments not were not to exceed five percent of total cost, uh, and the terms uh, of collaboration were reduced from ten to five years. Now you know this, is, which means yeah. that complete indigenization should happen uh, within five years. Uh, no, no, with that you know 
hardly any foreign investors would actually consider uh, uh, yeah. coming in. Um, and the, uh, uh, the last list included only two types of products, uh, those whose uh, production did not exist and those for which there was only one producer, generally a foreign firm with no competitor. So, you know, uh, 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 you, you got uh, 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 so so this third list was you know the last one that I just talked about those in which foreign investment and technical collaboration uh, both uh, would be permitted. So there's a small list of products where yeah. uh, both foreign investment and, and collaboration were permitted, uh, but uh, uh, it was a short list it included only these two types of products, uh, 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 those whose uh, production did not exist. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if domestic producers are not interested in producing those products, it's unlikely that, you know, foreign producers are going to come in and set up. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so even though in principle it was allowed, you know, the, the, the restriction really was such that hardly anyone would dare come in. Uh, and then there was uh, 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 also some concession there that if there was only one producer, uh, which was generally a foreign firm, then again, uh, they were uh, they allowed. So that is about it. So, you, you know, uh, either it has to be a product which is not produced or it has to be a product where there is only one producer. Yeah. So you can imagine, you know. So <laughs> then, then beginning in 1972, approval of applications for capacity expansion became subject to a reduction in foreign equity also. Yeah. That if you want to, you know, expand domestic expand your production capacity uh, and you happen to have for an invested uh, 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 partner uh, uh, and a partner who is a foreign investor then you have to reduce the equity yeah. as, you know otherwise otherwise you can't expand yeah. so, i think so this was around, something you know. that was going i think this was the reason the bajaj vespa marriage broke up I think this might have been one of the reasons because Bajaj wanted to expand capacity and they had a tie up with Vespa, which was the Italian uh, collaborator. And then eventually that didn't quite work out. And then Bajaj tried to go in the different direction and market it as Bajaj Chetak and so on. Yeah, that, that may have been a little later, though. A little I later? Think. Yeah, that may have been a little later because I, I because I recall that uh, maybe, you know, uh, maybe Bajaj had because... Uh, Vespa was still there uh, till the late 60s. I mean, the, I'm just trying to recall from my own uh, memory yeah. uh, because those were the years I was still in India. But but that needs to be checked. It's possible. I mean, it's possible. Yeah. So, so, but it needs to be checked. Yeah. Yeah. So there are 72. And then, of course, came the mother of all restrictions, uh, the, the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act of 1973. This is the infamous Fera, you know, yes. much uh, uh, dreaded and infamous, <laughs> in, in, infamous Fera. Uh, I mean, this was the act, you know, and if, if, if you were uh, an Indian national, Indian resident, and you were caught even with $5 uh, 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 in your possession, that would be grounds for the for jail. I mean, yeah. it, 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 you, you simply were not allowed. Uh, uh, and, and it was enforced, you know, so it's yeah. not uh, it a pretty serious uh, <laughs> pretty serious act, but it, it had obviously uh, a, a lot of implications for foreign investment. I, I think you know that really restricted the space. I mean, it was already being restricted given all yeah. the measures that I've described, but FARA in particular went uh, yet further in terms of restricting the space for the uh, foreign investors. So it came to require that all non bank foreign branches and companies incorporated in India that had foreign equity share in excess of 40% to obtain permission from RBI to continue business in India. Now, you know, so anybody who had more than 40% yeah. uh, uh, equity, they were required and they were uh, incorporated in India, they were required to reduce that. Uh, uh, well, they were required actually I mean, the, the, the regulation of the FERA says that go and get the uh, permission of the RBI to continue business. Now, of course, RBI is also part of the government, really. And <laughs> especially in those days, there is no yes. independence There's of no the separation. RBI. 
Yeah, it's separate. I mean, it's also, of course, it should today that sort of thing will never be the mandate of the RBI. I mean, you yeah. know, who is RBI to give permission on uh, on uh, um, foreign exchange? Uh, right? I mean, it really is a function of the government itself. It's not RBI. Yeah. But anyway, that's how policy. I mean, that is that tells you about the extent to which the RBI was very much a part of the government in those Absolutely. days. Absolutely. Yeah. So then RBI would grant this permission only if the foreign branches and companies diluted foreign equity share to 40% or less. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> in effect, uh, 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 all the enterprises were told that uh, uh, reduce your equity, foreign equity to 40% or less. So with two main exceptions, non-bank branches uh, or companies unwilling to dilute their foreign equity share to 40% had to wind up their business. Uh, and as a part of that, of course, the two famous examples, uh, uh, IBM and Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, yeah. Uh, they, they both both left India. Uh, um, uh, and, and Coke returned, you know, many, many years later. Uh, yeah, in the after, 90s. After, after 91 liberalization, after 91 yeah. liberalization, they came back, yeah. Uh, and of course, so there was a whole long period during which we all remember, you know, there's Kampa Cola, Thumbs Up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the Indian Dukes. made. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so, you know, the Indian made uh, soft drinks that uh, came. Uh, although once Coca-Cola came, I think they, they basically absorbed all those. <laughs> yeah. Indian they, they absorbed all those and Pepsi came just before liberalization, I think, yeah. you know, so that yeah. was the other, other big move, but it's so strange. I mean, you're right in that if the requirement is that you have to reduce equity to 40%, what they're really saying to a foreign firm is they need to significantly give up control of the enterprise. Right. Uh, and, and giving up control over the enterprise is not just about production and profits. It's also about quality and technology and standards and companies that are unwilling to give up that kind of control or reduce their standards to their Indian partners. Naturally, they leave. So it's not surprising that firms like IBM and Coca-Cola left. And it might have been, uh, you know, it had the market was very large in India, but it had a lot more to do with control and quality than it had to do with, oh, this is 3% more equity or 10% less equity or something like that. Yeah. Well, in the case of Coca-Cola, actually, the, the control was uh, central no? because uh, yeah. uh, they had been keeping their uh, formula uh, secret. Uh, uh, yes. secret. And, and uh, 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 Indian control would have meant that uh, they would they would Sharing have to it with a the formula. Yeah. So yeah. I think that was the re- that was the reason for Coca Cola to to wind up and leave. Yeah. Yeah. So and then they, IBM, you know, of course, for you know again quality reasons, right? And and it's such a big loss in a sense because Indian computing industry, both hardware and and software, kind of goes you know shifts back ten years <laughs> because yeah. now well, they, important yeah, partners they, have they, left. Yeah. I mean IBM. Probably also had the same similar issues, I would imagine, you know, like Coca-Cola, because uh, uh, it, it would mean giving up, uh, you know, what was state-of-the-art technology at the time uh, in, in, in uh, computer industry. Uh, and, and so they, they probably that played a role in their departure as well. Yeah. So, uh, and a number absolutely. of smaller firms, of course, left. They're not as, uh, you know, they're not in the folklore like IBM and Coca-Cola, but a lot of foreign firms wound up either because they were unwilling to live with the with the loss of control or because they saw it as a sort of, you know, a uh, uh, foreboding time that was coming that, you know, if this is yeah. where we are today, then tomorrow something else will be introduced and it's probably right. best to pack up and leave. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so so there was very few kind of you know uh, 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 enterprises uh, left which could have uh, 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 more than forty percent equity. Yeah. So they allowed you know uh, with some exceptions where you could have up to seventy four percent. Nobody could have hundred percent, but uh, yeah. uh, except except possibly bank branches which were owned. But but so up to seventy four percent they allowed for an equity. Uh, in, in in a number of uh, types of enterprises, although you yeah. know, uh, not not that many in any either in any one of these categories existed. So there were if there was some manufacturer who were who was producing a product in the core sector, uh, mm-hmm. you remember that this core sector was identified uh, uh, around uh, seventy two and seventy three. 
uh, this list of highly capital intensive industries. So if, if uh, there was a foreign uh, invested enterprise uh, which was producing uh, a product in the core sector, then they could uh, keep uh, up to 74% uh, equity. Yeah. Then there were uh, uh, enterprises engaged in manufacturing uh, uh, and exporting 60% or more of their output. So as long yeah. as you're earning foreign you exchange. You can earn foreign country, exchange. <laughs> yeah. And then, then, then they were kind of allowed. Uh, 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 tea sector, I think, you know, these yeah. were tea plantations, yeah. uh, which, which had been foreign owned. And uh, there was fear, obviously, again, that uh, uh, forcing forcing the owners of uh, uh, those tea states might actually have adverse impact on tea exports. I, yeah. I mean, I, I imagine that was that was the motivation, uh, which which allowed the uh, uh, government to to allow tea states to stay in the foreign hands as well. Uh, then there was an exception also granted uh, uh, to those creating skills and infrastructure that were not available indigenously and contributed to exports. This is a bit more vague. So I imagine that that, uh, that category gave uh, the, the bureaucrats a little bit of uh, 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 room for uh, uh, manipulation. And then there were the foreign branches of uh, airlines and uh, uh, shipping companies that were also yeah. uh, 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 allowed Except. up to 70, 74%. Yeah. So that was one set of exceptions. Uh, there was a second uh, uh, set of exceptions, which was introduced later in 1976. Uh, and under that exception, they allowed a maximum of 51% foreign equity uh, in two types of companies, those exporting 40% of the pro production. So this is a modification of the earlier yeah. provision, which uh, uh, because probably you know there were not that many uh, enterprises exporting sixty percent, <laughs> so yeah. they reduced that to to forty percent. Uh, 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 but but then also said you know you can have up to fifty one percent, not seventy four. And then the at least sixty percent of the output was uh, had to be in the core sector, uh, and export. Then if you export ten percent, then also they were allowed. So it is just you know some concession. Some given. tinkering. Yeah, some tinkering, small. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but this also companies... meant that these companies became a different category of companies, right? So yes, if you yes. have the Nehru regime, where you you think about firms, foreign firms will be given the same treatment as domestic firms. Now this changes things because, like MRTP firms are a special category. Now Ferra companies are a special category. Yes, absolutely. So so these companies, you know, which took these exceptions. And, and and stayed in India. Uh, uh, they came to be known as fair companies. Yeah. Yeah. What was the differential treatment between these companies? Was it good to be a fair company or was it bad to be a fair company? <laughs> because these things can go both ways depending on what they are producing and what the relationship is. No, I mean you know if you if if you feel that you are going to be profitable here, uh, uh, then you have no choice. I mean. It's not yeah. as though there was a choice between being a fairer company and being something else. Yes. Uh, meaning that, you know, only other choice was to disinvest and, and yeah. reduce your equity below 40%. Uh, uh, then you can be in the other category. Uh, yeah. And, and that, that will uh, reduce uh, some of the restrictions that fairer companies face. Uh, but other than that, you know, uh, if you wanted to be a company with 51% or more, uh, 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 up to fifty-one percent investment, controlling share. You had no choice. You have to be fair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, yeah, you would be ruled. Yeah, by and the, you know, it's for, aside from the fact that there were fera companies versus non-fera companies. Every individual who wanted to have any foreign exchange was a fera individual, in the sense that it applied to virtually everyone, and and sometimes. Uh, you know, foreign exchange balances as low as $5 and $10 uh, were regulated. Uh, any company, even a 100% domestically owned company, if they had to go abroad, they needed to go to the RBI and the Commerce Ministry, request special permissions for foreign exchange, and, you know, give them a clean plan of what they intended to do with that foreign exchange. So I think uh, Narayan Murthy has uh, an example where he talks about uh, traveling to Germany, and they had to go to multiple cities. Uh, 
Uh, but when they request the permission, they say we will first go to, you know, Berlin, then Frankfurt and then Munich. I'm just making this up. I can't remember the exact detail. Mm. So, you know, they have these three cities and then some meeting gets changed. And now they no longer have to go to Frankfurt. They have to go to Paris instead. But when they come back, they have to explain to the RBI why they changed their plan and why they went to Paris instead of Frankfurt and, you know, uh, what foreign exchange balances were spent and how much came back. So, you know, in some sense, we think, oh, this is a Ferra company. This applies to these foreigners or these, you know, these suits who are coming from Atlanta, like Coca-Cola. But actually, Ferra just impacted every single person who wished to have anything to do you know, outside the country in terms of foreign exchange. Uh, you know, I'm sure you experienced it. You must have some <laughs> stories of trying to go abroad and have some cash balances as a student, right? So what was your experience? Yeah. yeah. No, so I think there used to be something called the P form. Yes. Uh, and 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 uh, so I remember uh, I got about $200 from the RBI. And there was some provision that at, uh, at the airport, you could get another $7. Wow. So I don't know why, why why was there that provision of no I can't remember but I remember this that there was a provision to get another seven dollars so that's all the money I had so two hundred and seven dollars and you landed in two hundred and seven dollars yeah yeah that was it that was it we are not allowed nothing else you know so yeah uh, that tough. is extraordinary yeah, maybe, yeah yeah. It significantly but, uh, impedes, you know, other kinds of human capital development, right? Just the ability uh, to go abroad and get a law degree or a PhD. Uh, so in, in a sense, it impacts everything that is happening in India. Knowledge building, capital formation, foreign investment. I mean, this kind of foreign exchange draconian law is just uh, crazy. There is no way I could have come uh, without the fellowship I had from Princeton, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, it's just uh, not within the realm of possible. I mean, anyway, you know, right? <laughs> you also needed, uh, e even if the uh, fera was not there, you needed uh, uh, some uh, domestic currency resources, <laughs> which also I lacked. So yeah, so but the fera makes it complicated even after you got the fellowship. Let's put it. That yeah, way, I think right? you know. I mean, it makes the logistics very difficult. You know that. Yeah. Uh, you are worried that you are going out with two hundred seven dollars in your pocket. You know, <laughs> I mean, what if you? I mean, I'll tell you. Actually, I remember this that uh, uh, my fear in the first year was that what if I fail? I, you know, I got to have at least enough money for uh, to be able to pay my airfare back to return back. to India. Right. So that's true. Uh, so that that was my worry that, because uh, you know, uh, going in, my father paid the uh, airfare. But coming back, I did not want to ask him uh, for for the return fare also. Uh, <laughs> so so I, I tell you, I was so relieved. 1975, uh, so 74, I came in. After one year, I got a job at the World Bank in the summer. So I got three months, and was, you know, the, the salary was 900 some dollars. And so I figured, okay, okay I'm, you know, you with three months, you got close to three thousand dollars. Uh, uh, you you saved about two thousand out of that. <laughs> and, so you have enough money so to you, to get catch a flight back. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow, yeah. So. <laughs> that's extraordinary. Uh, you know, so. so this of course continues for a while. This kind of invert turn, but post emergency, or at least actually not even post emergency, even with the announcement of the emergency starting in nineteen seventy five. Some adjustment and tinkering starts happening in the other direction. You know, there are some concessions given. There is some, I mean, many call it liberalization. You've called it phased liberalization or at least, you know, a step-by-step -step, uh, move in certain sectors uh, to increase capacity or to allow, uh, you know, more participation in the market. Uh, can you walk us through that? Because there is a period between 75 and 90 where there are some moves in the opposite direction, away from this kind of invert turn, uh, before we get to the big moment of liberalization in 91. Yeah. Okay. So so there is now, you know, uh, uh, not on foreign investment, by the way. For, foreign investment, maybe under Rajiv Gandhi, there is some. Yeah. Uh, uh, those are also relatively piecemeal. But yeah. uh, at least, you know, uh, and, and there are numbers, you know, about uh, how many companies actually. Yes. 
uh, got the permission from RBI and, and yeah. how many were denied and so forth, you know, but but very little. So foreign investment largely uh, doesn't get a reprieve, serious reprieve in any way uh, yeah. uh, till the 91 reforms. Yes. Uh, but 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 on trade side, I think, you know, uh, uh, some some uh, changes do begin to happen. Um, Beginning mid mid seventies, let's say you know roughly mid seventies. So uh, we 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 had sort of you know talked about how uh, how the uh, uh, import uh, to GDP ratio by nineteen sixty nine seventy was four percent dropped to yeah mainly now dropped to four percent in sixty nine seventy right right. So uh, 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 and during this period, export performance remained relatively flat. Uh, and big gap between you know the imports and exports. So import exports as a percent of GDP during these years until about uh, until 1968-69 are about four percent. Yeah. And 69-70 they fall further to 3.6 percent. Uh, so so not not much action you know uh, 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 at, at least uh, until 69-70 and and exports remain low. Only reason actually the imports are maintaining still a bit above, right? You know, exports are bringing revenue up to 4% of GDP, but imports during this period are, are, are more up to, you know, uh, before they drop to 4%, they, they are like 5% in the 68, 69. Pri- yeah. Prior to that year, they were about close to 6%. Uh, and all. so that gap was being maintained largely, I think, by a lot of the food imp- food imports were happening. Yeah. And there was PL480 and, and so yes. forth, you know, and, and some... Some uh, borrowing may have been happening, foreign aid may have been coming. So those were the sources of foreign exchange that bridged the gap between the yeah. the foreign exchange earned from exports and foreign exchange required to import. For imports. Yeah. So early 70s, similar, this, this pattern remains, you know, uh, 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 imports uh, 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 in the subsequent years don't, you know, they do not rise uh, beyond 4.5% until like 74 75 so the the imports remain between 4 and 5% during uh, the first half of the 70s uh, and exports remain below 4% uh, it's strictly below it's about 3% but it's below 4% so that's the rough kind of out scenes in terms of these uh, where uh, i think 73 74 there is a little bit of break 73 yeah. 74 uh, it, uh, you know this was oil oil price crisis if you recall uh, uh, and uh, 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 at the same time, there was also general commodity boom, yeah, uh, commodity price boom. Let's say, but yeah. it, I mean, you know, commodity prices had had you know seen seen, seen a bit of a boom during seventy three, seventy four, uh, and in particular, I think you know uh, 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 the the uh, um, sugar, for example, there was also uh, partly this uh, had like from India's point of view. There was sugar, for instance, uh, where uh, uh, crop failures had happened both in Cuba and Brazil during that year. Yeah. And, and that allowed India to actually expand its sugar exports. Now, yeah. domestically, those of us who were in India at this time, you know, yes. really suffered through because sugar was a very controlled item. Uh, yes. uh, it, 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 and you got uh, uh, something like uh, one kilogram per person or something like that. Yes. You know, some very limited, limited amount of sugar, actually. Uh, so there through was a, a ration card, I remember through a ration card, and and you know there's a black market in sugar and whatnot. Yes. And a lot of people would using good to <laughs> make their tea and all. You know, yeah. sugar was so expensive. So anyway, uh, um, that that was uh, uh, part of it. So so that helped 70, 74, 74, 75. Also, I think commodity prices remained uh, elevated. Uh, particularly in the 74 75 year we got uh, help on uh, uh, things like tea and uh, tea particularly because uh, kenya and sri lanka had crop failures in tea so yeah. so that helped india uh, bridge the gap so uh, uh, that allowed a little bit of uh, uh, expansion both of exports and of uh, imports during 73 74 74 75 uh, but but uh, the the more important catalyst uh, you know uh, uh, were, were different. I mean, these were yeah. a few little things that that uh, a market conditions kind of uh, yeah eased eased up the foreign exchange uh, just a little bit, not not yeah. by by big margin, but just a little bit. 
but uh, uh, politically really you know from as far as the businesses were concerned there was always pressure uh, because yeah. they had difficulty getting their raw materials getting yeah. their components uh, intermediate input so there was always this pressure that look you know we, the government needs to do something so so that yeah. pressure was there uh, but something else also had to happen uh, uh, for for uh, for uh, uh, liberalization to happen and that something had to be that where is the foreign exchange going to come from yeah. that was really the, the the crucial issue so two things happened which helped one was the oil crisis also opened the door to migration uh, of of the indians to the middle east yeah and and that began bringing in uh, remittances. These remittances yeah so uh, so you know uh, 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 there was some bit of migration earlier also before the oil price crisis but there was small but after you know with that sort of having that my my the set of migrants in, in the middle east was helpful because when the when when the oil prices rose and yeah. uh, these revenues became available to the oil exporting countries yeah. they wanted the to bring in more workers and and so the fact that we already had a kind of uh, uh, foothold in 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 the middle east helped you know that migration could expand and re- respond and expand uh, pretty yeah. quickly and that so, continues so the, even today you know the foothold that, that is, was yeah. set up oh, in yeah, the yeah, early yeah. 70s yeah. Uh, even now we have a, a very substantial number of people seasonally or annually migrating to the middle east and sending back huge remittances you right right no i mean today india's remittances are practically about 1% of, of the uh, several percent yeah. yeah i mean you know yeah. it's it's quite quite a bit 2 to 3% of the gdp so very large today of course yeah i mean there about 6 67 yes. i mean the last actually number 100 billion hit we hit 100 billion actually there was In the remittances. latest figure that wow. i remember yeah yeah so it's so, fantastic it's very large so arvin these are relatively sort of what i call circumstantial things that were happening that impacted india's uh, sort of balance of trade situation so you know if there is a drought within india and there are two or three bad droughts it severely impacts right if there are crop failures in other countries then it boosts india's exports and brings in a little bit more so these are sort of what is happening globally and domestically in markets but was there much movement in policy uh you know which which moved us towards liberalization either because of pressure from the business community or others such as you know liberalizing the licensing regime like the open general license you know and so on or were mostly what was happening in the mid 70s just restricted to all these circumstantial things which may have benefited india a little bit here and there yeah no i think the very early one is is circumstantial uh, and so one was this remittances which uh, helped help uh, uh, bring in more foreign exchange so you know even by uh, uh, like 70 around 1970 71 your remittances are about 134 million dollars yeah. uh, by 75 76 524 24 million so you know almost yeah. a fourfold increase uh, that's quite substantial so that's one factor that's at work Uh, uh and after that of course you know in the second half of the 70s uh, uh, these remittances were rising by about 300 billion every year uh, mm-hmm. uh, and such that by by 79 80 uh, 2.2 billion so it was a, a very large amount actually uh, uh, yeah. for that that time period that time, for that time yeah. period and the other thing that happened was that uh, you remember that uh, the the uh, around 1971 the the entire ex- the breton woods exchange rate system yes. was collapsing yes uh and and uh, uh, after that collapse actually some of the european currencies appreciated yeah uh, uh mark you know the german mark french yeah. franc uh, uh, so they uh, now they appreciated uh, which means relative to those currencies the dollar and the british pound depreciated yeah we we were pegged to these currencies in rupee was so that allowed rupee to also depreciate against the uh, european uh, these other european currencies yeah without actively That's, depreciating without actively depreciating uh, 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 and that depreciation also helped exports a bit yes uh, so so that they happen uh, also uh, i think now this this begins to go uh, uh, into the second half of the 70s Uh, that uh, in september 1975 uh, 
finally india decided to uh, uh, let uh, rupee depreciate about uh, uh, sorry they, they, what happened was that they uh, pegged the rupee now to a basket of currencies so this was yeah. the, this was a big important policy change uh, 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 september 1975 so rather than peg to the british pound or to the to the us dollar what we did was that we are going to peg the currency to a basket of currencies now yeah. you know you can always play with the weights on uh, on on different yeah. currencies in the basket yeah. uh, and and play with the exchange rate a lot more it gives you a much greater uh, flexibility yeah and uh, uh, th- this flexibility was used uh and uh, 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 apparently you know between 1974 75 and 78 79 right so that's uh, uh, what uh, 75 77 78 four years four years in four years in four years time the rupee depreciated about the 30% against the yeah. british pound yeah so so that depreciation was very helpful uh yeah. in in uh, uh, you know uh, they could not devalue in the usual yes. sense after the, after what happened in june 1966 but, but it happened uh, naturally to some extent but 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 this was surreptitious you know yeah. <laughs> without anybody noticing there were no announcements to be done and all but on yeah. a basically at, at at the technical level the rbi could basically you know achieve that that depreciation so that was a very smart thing to have done so that depreciation helped uh, the merchandise exports big time they grew from 4 billion in 74 75 to 6.4 billion in 77 78 yeah. now in you know, today's context over these are small numbers but uh, no but, but it was uh, a big improvement know, then that was, improvement, india was a tiny billion. economy and so much compression of the external yeah. sector that even a little bit of liberalization through depreciation or something else just has this big impact you know exactly exactly so you know so for and 4 billion to 6.4 billion that's more than 50% expansion yeah. right you know yeah. so that's that's uh, again within those four or five years uh, it continued you know uh, it uh, in the following year 7980 it went to 7.8 billion uh, 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 services exports also stepped mm-hmm. in uh, so they they went up from 632 million in 74 75 to 1.2 billion in 77 78 and then to 1.9 billion in 79 80 so yeah. why 79 80 right uh, your total exports have become uh, this is uh, 7.8 plus 1.9 so it, it's about 10.7 billion so that's a very large you know uh, compared to where we were 74 75 if you take you know um, uh, uh, the the uh, it's 6.4 plus 1.2 so what's 7.6 billion so it's from 7.6 billion in 77 78 uh, we went to 10.7 billion in uh, uh, 79 80 so good expansion and and that is what then gives the government confidence uh, to begin liberalizing on the import side So, yeah. so this was the so this one single factor the depreciation about thirty yeah. percent depreciation uh, uh, became uh, uh, the 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 catalyst yeah uh, to 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 liberalization on the import side that was to follow so uh, you know here on we can discuss a little bit if you wish uh, on on the import side of it you know what, yes how. How how that? So, seventy five, seventy six. Some small steps get taken, uh, uh, but important. Well, they prove important yeah. for the future, not necessarily for seventy five, seventy six itself, but but for the future. So, one important thing that was done in seventy five, seventy six was to resurrect the open general licensing general list. list. which which had uh, uh, basically had been lying dormant at that time so it was a small change uh, six items got pl- placed on it uh, and there was you know some free trade zones were also included in it meaning that you know free trade zones could also uh, yeah. uh, um, uh, 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 any enterprise in the free trade zones could import uh, uh, under open general license 
Uh, And then the six items that they put on the list could be imported by anybody, regardless of where their location was. Um, 76, 77, uh, uh, some of the iron and steel items and some of the machinery requirements uh, by leather industry were added to open general licensing as well. Then a much larger expansion took place in 77, 78. Yeah. Uh, they uh, expanded the OGL, the Open General Licensing List, uh, uh, to include leather making machinery, garment making machinery, a large number of drugs, medicines, chemicals, electronic items, iron and steel items, and scientific and technical books. So, so there was this. So now th- this became an important instrument for the government uh, of liberalization. This had always been used. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, starting from the Second World War itself open general licensing had been used uh, uh, and, and you know whenever foreign exchange became available they could they would use this instrument when it did not when you know so this had always been in play but but now you know uh, uh, for a while it had not been there but now having been resurrected they started expanding that then in 75 76 itself uh, they had also introduced a second way to liberalize and that was the system of automatic license. Now, yes. in a way, if you think about it, you know, the word automatic license carries a little bit of contradiction, you know. <laughs> it means it's not <laughs> licensed. <laughs> uh, I mean, either it's not licensed or it's not automatic. I mean, yeah. You know? <laughs> but uh, but uh, that, that's how our system, system was. That uh, so under automatic license, basically what it did was that uh, there was a list of selected industries uh, which uh, were given. So a list was drawn up of of industries. So within those, and it's a fairly liberal list. Uh, so within those selected industries, uh, uh, they were uh, the the enterprises were given exemption from the uh, domestic non-availability condition. As you recall, you know, we discussed this yeah. when we discussed the import regime. Yes. That uh, you had to set, satisfy the essentiality and uh, domestic non-availability. non-availability condition. So so they were given. And so now you no longer had to apply, uh, uh, you know, through uh, uh, something like um, uh, sponsoring agency. You know, usually yeah. the usual, usual track used to be that you, Put in your application for the imports first to the sponsoring agency, which then gives you the clearances on these essentiality and uh, domestic non-availability, and then the application goes to the uh, uh, the, the, the um, uh, uh, what is it called CCI and E. Uh, yes, the chief, chief controller chief of control imports and exports. Of imports and exports, you know. So so now for the, under the automatic license, you could apply directly to the CCI and E. Yeah. So, chief, so so that sort of uh, some some easing up. This is a procedural easing yeah. up. Um, no, but the procedural uh, easing up helped a lot because it meant fewer trips made to Delhi and fewer, yeah. you know, visits to different ministries to get your file through from one desk to another. So it sounds simple, but on a day to day basis, it does change a lot for the the firm or the businessman. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and some of the liberalization was also done through the exporters. Right, yes. you know, there's always in the Indian system has always been there that you know uh, restrictions exist, but for exporters we'll make an exception. Yeah. So the export, you know, so they uh, they tried to uh, also improve the access of the exporters to imported inputs. Right, yeah. so they expanded the import entitlement. Uh, so under import entitlement, an exporter got a certain amount of imports permitted, yeah. you know, without license. Uh, 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 also, there was the import replenishment uh, yeah. license. Under that, you basically, uh, you know, any once once your imported inputs got used up, they were replenished, yeah. meaning that you know automatically you you get to once you have used up, you provide the evidence uh, that yeah. you have used up your then. and then duty drawback also uh, was was uh, uh, offered. Uh, to the exporters, so so that also became another instrument. Now, very interestingly, I discovered actually uh, uh, some of the, the uh, through some of the reading. I, uh, you know, uh, uh, we all think uh, of uh, 
the uh, liberalization of computers right that it was done by rajiv gandhi right that's yeah. the, that's the story that we all have heard but there was a actually prior <laughs> step that was taken much much before rajiv gandhi actually it was during the emergency so uh, july 1976 so you know uh, what they did was there was the um, the the electronics commission used to exist already then Yeah, uh, something you know called. So they announced the policy for the import of computer systems by Indians returning from abroad or those residing abroad under the provisions of the import trade control policy of seventy six seventy seven. So you know, liberalization, first liberalization of <laughs> computer imports happened during the emergency. During emergency, yeah. So, wow. <laughs> so the you know basically individuals uh, were allowed to import computers provided they came up with necessary foreign exchange and use the computers for specialized applications and overseas customers uh, in areas such as engineering design engineering consultancy and process control so Of course, even that is controlled. What they use the computer for, but but sure, there yes, is some yes. move towards liberalization. Yes, yes, yes. It is such a strange time <laughs> that yes, these are big. Yes. That 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 we consider these important moves towards reform. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So after this, no. Comes, also, sorry. also by the way, we we used to have these export controls. Remember? Yes. so even on the export side there were all kinds of restrictions yeah uh, and, and and so some of the liberalization happened on the export side also yeah. so 75 76 again about two thirds of the items that were subject subject to export licensing yeah uh, were freed up so yeah. i think something close to about 300 items had been subject to export licensing wow so about two thirds of those were were pretty much freed up you know uh uh and in 1977 78 some of the remaining items were placed on the open general licensing uh through uh, uh some export regulation though you know some export regulations remain uh one example i found actually of this was the shoe exports yeah so shoe exports you see were at at one time actually canalized Yeah. Uh, uh, which, you may have to explain the, what uh, canalizing is for the yeah. young listeners and uh, young readers because yeah. this is such a bizarre thing but there was actually a canal or a government channel through which goods could be brought in and out of the country which seems very bizarre. So can you first explain canalization and then how we reduce the number of goods that needed to be canalized over time? Yeah. So I mean you know this is a old history the 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 Yeah, uh, the the agency to canalize uh, the big one state trading corporation state trading corporation was created somewhere around you know 19 second half of the 1950s yeah it was, it was a very early in history at the time it was for some very specific items that this that and what canalization amounts to is giving monopoly of trade to a state agency Yeah. of which state trading corporation was only one although the really the biggest one yeah then you had something like uh, mmtc minerals yes. and metals trading corporation there were several others uh, uh, which were more specialized but state trading corporation was the big one now you know there were all sorts of reasons for 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 this you know originally one of the key driving forces was also that uh, 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 to because the eastern european countries uh, basically you are dealing with the governments so to to conduct trade with that they, uh, the government felt that they also needed a state agency to to then negotiate the agreements with with yeah. with, with the eastern european countries uh, so then you needed a, a state agency which would then conduct that particular trade with the eastern european countries uh, but there were other reasons uh, uh, that you know uh, uh, if, if there were too many small little importers of 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 many products uh, uh, for each of them to go and import the product was a problem so a state trading corporation will do the importing and then yeah. you know this uh, allocate those to uh, to to the domestic users of those uh, those products uh, 
similarly on the export side if the you know if the exporters were very small potential exporters yeah. were very small it was harder for them to do so they will canalize yeah. so shoe was one of those products you know remember these there is this small scale industries reservation going on so yeah. no, there is no large uh, the, the potential there is no large uh, exporter here uh, all small uh, so the state trading corp- corporation steps in says you know i will export your products yeah this is very tiny style you know if you uh, exactly. if you looked at you know the china had all these trading companies you know trade uh, foreign trade uh, companies uh, which did all the, which had the monopoly of uh, of trade yeah. in, in fact just just uh, as st the state trading corporation had on certain products mmtc had a uh, monopoly on certain products so th- uh, like that so <laughs> anyway around this time they Uh, 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 there is a good example of how we, you know, made policy. So around this time, seventy five, seventy six, they did actually uh, allow begin to now allow shoe exports under open general licensing, meaning that in, individual manufacturers could sell. But then we put a uh, minimum export price. <laughs> so the, the, the minimum export price was seventy five rupees. uh and and the story this was a story actually in the times of india uh, of that time period uh, uh that story says that you know at that time even the italians uh could export their shoes only uh, for, for 75 rupees only 15% of their ex- shoe exports oh. so so there were about 85 of percent of the italian shoes were also selling at less than 75 rupees per pair so to expect that these uh, indian shoes would uh, compete go at a price of 75 rupees or more was 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 completely unrealistic implausible so in a way you liberalize <laughs> but you know probably nobody could 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 fetch that price yeah uh, so the, the, you know the, the, these kinds of all kinds of anomalies existed in our system at the time yeah and decanalizing meant that from a system where they could only go through one of these trading co- uh, you know corporations or mmtc or something else they slowly start saying that you can trade on your own but if for instance like unlike shoes if there wasn't a minimum price was there an uptick in exports in those areas was there an expansion in uh, you know those sorts of uh, goods or it's hard to find data for that yeah um but we have to look at it i don't know yeah I, i i don't know the answer i really don't know the answer um so but you know here since we are on to canalization uh this area actually was going in the other direction so as i said you know this is largely otherwise some bit of liberalization phase this i can have of the 70s yeah uh, but one area where we are actually also simultaneously going in the opposite direction is canalization there is progressively more canalization uh, uh, of uh, uh, imports particularly yeah. uh, and and uh, as we get to 1980s i will have some some more figures uh, but uh, uh, even in 74 75 they expanded the list you know there were 200 items already under canalization they added another 10 in 74 75 and that process continued actually through the yeah to the uh, through the second second half of the 70s uh, uh, it 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 began to unwind the 80s okay in the 80s we began to unwind it uh, so so yeah um so in absolute just terms, just as a as a uh, you know reminder though there is an increase in the 70s and there's a slight relaxation in the 80s when we think of canalization we're talking about a list of more than 1000 goods more than 1000 commodities at one point uh, had to be canalized until the 91 reforms happen and you know eventually they decanalize in a in a significant manner right like this list is yeah. a pretty big one no i mean i i don't know the number of items on the list uh, Uh, one number that i have is is from 74 75 when it the, the list the number was 210 but i think will come later uh, if i remember correctly though uh, by 80 81 nearly 60% of the imports were coming under canalization yeah 
so that was that was a very large proportion you know yes. uh, more than half more than half of your imports became canalized but that will yeah. get checked as we as we uh, proceed further yeah um so um now on the export side also you 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 had some restrictions introduced so you know this process is always you know all you can say is that on balance this was a liberalizing phase but for some particular items you did introduce more restrictions as well things like export taxes on tea and coffee uh, you know at any time that the global prices of tea and coffee went up the government would also raise the export taxes yeah uh, and so you know that 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 some of this is a windfall gain and, and and you know they should not get windfall gain but these are the types of things which are very detrimental to the development of the industry because if the industry says that you know any time we have more profit you are going to tax it away then there is no incentive for us to you know yeah take measures med productivity enhancing measures you know we take productivity enhancing measures improve our export performance but then you are going to come back and hit us with more export tax so it doesn't yeah. pay so so i think you know the, the, these policies in the end were uh, a bit detrimental but but that was the kind of thinking that that prevailed that yeah. dominated the system that you know uh, uh, so so particularly on the export side we used to tax quite a bit uh, uh, yeah. you know the traditional exports of uh, jute tea uh, um, uh, 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 jute products uh, uh sometimes even textiles you know so you would put these export taxes yeah uh in in the belief that we had market power but you know temporarily you do have market power it is true but the fallout from it is that uh, substitutes come in or the other countries find begin to find the uh, 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 exporting more profitable right you know if, if you are raising the price export yeah. price Uh, by restricting your exports because you got monopoly power you don't see that there are potential exporters sitting there on the fence who become competitive at that higher price absolutely so they they take away your 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 i mean you don't get the full advantage of your uh, export restriction uh, because even the price will not uh, rise as much as you thought it would rise because the yeah. other exporters come in and replace yeah. you Yeah. also the importers begin to find you know substitutes you know like we yeah. when we were ex- putting export taxes on jute substitution into plastics and other plastic bags and other kinds of uh, 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 materials uh, uh, got speeded up as a result so yeah. so you know one has to be very careful you know in in thinking that uh, uh, you you have monopoly power in the export markets uh, you yeah. rarely actually uh, it's it's a very temporary thing even if you have it yeah no and it's you know this period so of course what's interesting about this post emergency period that you're talking about is indira gandhi's government uh, you know after the elections doesn't come back so you have morarji desai who is the one of the members of the old syndicate who is much more liberal than indira gandhi uh, and the second is that even though the emergency is a, a you know post emergency government is a coalition government with very interesting group of people like you have you know members of the janasang but you also have jay prakash narayan who was sort of leading them at the helm against emergency who's an avowed gandhian socialist so it's an interesting group of people but in terms of a uh, sort of uh, you know the technocratic level which is you know what are these lists who is deciding what goes in the list and what doesn't go in the list what all needs to be rationalized what kind of prices need to be brought back to par i think that process starts with the morarji desai government right like they they start moving yeah. in a direction away from mrs gandhi and by the time mrs gandhi comes back you know in the 80s the process is also already underway and the gains from it are enough to give momentum to to sort of continue in that direction through the 80s is that a good way to think about you know yes. this phased liberalization in the late 70s yes yes so so yeah. I, in fact yeah i mean uh, 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 there is a slightly bigger change uh, uh, as we discussed just now you know 75 76 some changes begin to happen the ogl automatic licensing yeah. uh, um, so that had started but now you know uh, uh, and with the, the maraji desai government uh, a more activist uh, 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 policy comes in towards liberalization 
Yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, I, 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 you could say that, you know, under the earlier one, 75, 76, 77, 78 was a bit more opportunistic. That yeah. you know, export revenues became available, uh, and because of the exchange rate depreciation, exports also uh, expanded, and and so that yeah. gave the gave the uh, uh, even at the bureaucratic level, the uh, the officers got some confidence to liberalize. Yeah, uh, and then in the, now you know, then in the eighties we get what you have called in your uh, book, uh, you know, India the emerging giant liberalization by stealth. And so two things are happening in the 80s. One, of course, there are all these, you know, moves which are being made to reform both, you know, mainly on the export side, but also on the import side, you know, things like broadbanding, which affect domestic licensing regime uh, and so on. Uh, But also, you know, a lot of committees have been formed to look into the question of, you know, should we remove sugar subsidies, for instance? You know, what should we do about reforms in the external sector? Uh, So in the next episode can you walk us through the 80s sort of the big you know liberalization by stealth which is a lot of small things going on simultaneously and then how that leads up to the big moment in 91 of course preceded by a crazy balance of payments crisis like india is back exactly where it was in 65 66 maybe worse uh you know in in that period so maybe in the next episode you can you can take us through that entire journey where you know the a change has started forming All right so so we'll start with you know what is known as the pc alexander committee yes which was uh, uh, which uh, which reported in early 1978 yeah. uh, that that played you know the initial kind of uh, the, the morarji desai government initiative uh, yeah uh, 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 and that initiative started the process but but then you are absolutely right that uh, 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 Mrs. Gandhi, when she came in, it continued. Yeah. Uh, and and there is some case to be made that perhaps you know Mrs. Gandhi was herself a bit of a changed prime minister, uh, yeah. and, and P. N. Huxer was already behind her, yes. <laughs> so to say. Yeah. So, and there so are many many you know. reasons, but also you know once something succeeds, it gets a lot of uh, supporters, right? They say success has many fathers, <laughs> and 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 so if Suddenly, you know, opening up a little bit is bringing in more foreign exchange and, you know, firms have started doing better, which means businessmen start, you know, having better relationship with politicians and giving them a little bit more campaign finance money and donations and so on. Uh, There is a cycle which can which can propel that or, you know, keep that momentum uh, going. Uh, But the but the technical aspects of that, exactly what is going on in the economy in terms of specific policies, it would be great uh, to hear that from you. You know, it's the outline in quite a bit of detail in in your book but it would also be great to hear that from you both on the domestic and the foreign side uh, in our in our episode 8 okay good so let's do that thank you so much arvin this has been a pleasure and we will see you soon perfect perfect see you